The Bermuda Triangle is a legendary myth. Supposedly a lot of planes and stuff have gone missing there. It's always anecdotal. I've never seen a documentary where they actually detail a bunch of stuff happening. But it comes up in popular culture a lot. Yeah, it'll be kind of like one of those rumours where if you if you swallow a melon seed, it will sprout in your stomach and you'll be like, bullshit. I, I remember where I was at a little kid's party where there was a bouncy castle and then I ate a cherry with the seed in it and swallowed it. And I remember having like a little four-year-old existential crisis where I went off and sat away from everyone else and I was just thinking like, the tree's going to grow inside me <laughs> and kill me, accepting my fate. Your time has come. You learn early. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it starts off with our main character, Jess, with her son, who we quickly realise has some sort of severe special needs. If I'm honest with you, Declan, as soon as I saw Jess and the way she was acting, I kind of hated her a little bit. I'm not going to lie. Really? Why? I don't know. I just found her very annoying in a way she is all over the place at the start of the film first having a moment with her son where she's crying and she's upset it sounds like she's reassuring him but it sounds more like she's actually reassuring herself and we see her packing up she hears a doorbell go she goes to answer it no one seems to be there she's packing away her things she changes out of her dress for some reason because she seems to have spilt some paint on it and she gets in her car and heads on her way don't see if her son goes with her or or where they're going or what's going on next we see her She's at the harbour meeting everyone. We just heard, I don't know if Pigeon I picked up on the camera, but we could hear a bird outside, which obviously is very significant yeah, yeah, yeah. in the film. Yes, Ugh. yes, yeah. Maybe we've entered the triangle. We're, We're going to have to do podcasts forever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know, I wouldn't mind actually. <laughs> so she goes to the harbour and Greg is one of her customers at the coffee shop where she works. He obviously fancies her and he feels like, you know, you feel like they've got a budding relationship. In the morning when she was getting ready, you feel like she was quite excited for this day. But now she seems kind of just, I don't know, weird. And she meets Greg and she's talking to him. She hasn't met anyone else on the boat who they're going for this little day out on the sailing ship, which Greg lives on apparently with also this 18 year old runaway kid who he found missing. So you can tell Greg is a genuine guy and a good guy but he's also got Captain Save a whole itis going on where he's very much attracted to broken toys that he wants to try and pick up and fix and help but it does seem to come from an endearing place the fact that he's brought in this young lad as well shows that it is a more genuine than just trying to fuck a girl and getting her good books by being nice to her about her disabled son you get the distinct feeling that no one else really likes Jess on the boat everyone else is kind of like who is this chick you're inviting around and like and they're, they're also wondering like she was meant to bring her son but she says he's at school and we don't see the exchange but the young guy that's living on the boat with her talks about the fact that like it was pretty odd the way you can't believe there's a weird bird calling yeah. the whole time Nice. for this film that's so weird we're gonna have to keep going that's like no, no i'm not even saying for the sound i'm yeah, saying so weird. the fact that the film that's so prevalent in the f- so very creepily as soon as we started filming a bird started cr- crowing incessantly right outside my window never happened before in the whole five years that i've lived here and the noise of a bird is very prevalent in this film as we'll get on to later then mysteriously the mics went out moments later right as the bird stopped crowing and we had to restart and the computer turned really fucking weird so i don't Let's know what's going on this. i'm shitting we may have it. entered yeah, the loop i'm shitting myself just as we're approaching the first loop as well is that normal? What's your feelings of the film right now as we're approaching the storm? Some other characters, some other friends join us on the yacht. Um, they turn up late and they're like, sorry, the wife is an annoying bitch. She's like, oh, guess who had to work late again? Then they start fucking popping champagne and like sipping it. They're all rich bastards. She's like, oh, this champagne's horrible, but it's cold. You know, I'm not liking these people straight up. They're kind of out of Jess's earshot bitching about her son. Sally? What do you want me to say? I'm sorry she has a retarded son. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry. But you know, that's not Greg's problem, that's hers. Legit saying to each other, isn't her son retarded? Like, yeah. And I'm like, this is bang out of order. Straight away, I, I've not taken to any of these characters. I'm starting to feel a bit sorry for Jess at this point. Like these people talking behind her back. So I felt a bit bad about what I thought of her at the start. But she just seemed very delusional. Like going outside to the neighbour mowing the lawn and going, did someone ring my bell? Something wasn't quite right. And, mm. you know, <laughs> I, I got... 
uneasy feeling straight up. So they're sailing along, having fun. Jess sleeps for a couple of hours. As she's sleeping, she has these dreams of waking up on a beach. But once they're gone, she seems kind of disorientated and like she can't really remember the morning before. And Heather, the girl who's supposed to be set up with Greg, but neither of them are interested. She comes in and wakes her and she makes a passing comment about, oh, you know, they say dreams cleanse us of daytime trauma. So don't worry about it. You know, it's a good thing. Heather's the nicest to her. She's the, you know, and they're starting to become more involved in the group. And then there's this very eerie moment where the wind drops in an instant. Yo, what the fuck? Wind's dropped out on us. It's not dropped, it's gone. The subtle direction and choices of editing in the film are just bang on to create that sort of ominous setting. I don't know anything about sailing or how quickly the wind can stop, but the way they put that scene together is just perfect, creating an unsettling feeling of something abnormal is happening. Then we start to see the storm approaching from the distance. It's funny because on one level, it's really obviously bad CGI, which is one of the only things that let this film down at times. It's clearly a limited budget. They did great work with it, but it's not that great looking at times. It nearly adds to it though, because it's not quite a storm. It's confusing of what part of the supernatural elements of the film and what's not but I get a feeling that this isn't your typical storm especially the way the wind dropped and as this storm's approaching we start getting the SOS messages of someone who's in distress assumedly inside the storm which Greg is trying to answer we hear you what's your position over yeah, Captain Fantastic has gone on the radio, he's taking charge, and we hear a woman wailing down the phone like, help, help, help. Sounds like she's a ghost, like another world entity, and he's trying to communicate back with them. But by doing this, the storm is getting more and more severe, and then all of a sudden, bang, it starts lashing down with rain, just going crazy. In an instance, water starts coming onto the boat, and then all of a sudden, we've got some fucking Titanic type scenario. They're all drowning, they don't know what to do, and it's just crazy, Declan. Mm. Like, it moves at such speed. So the boat sinks and capsizes, but it's still upside down. Part of it's still submerged because it hasn't fully sunk yet, mm. and they're just sitting on top. Heather's died. All yeah. gone missing, sadly. And they're on top of it. And then after a while, in the distance, a large cruise liner starts to appear. And it looks really, really old right from the get-go. Again, not great special effects, yeah. but I'm so into the tone <laughs> of the film at this point. I 100% just forgive it. They're hoping the ship even stops and sees them because, you know, it's such a huge ship. You can even easily pass someone by in that scenario. And they can see someone looking at it from above, but the person just ignores them, doesn't hear their calls, walks away. And they can't really see it because the sun's behind them they're silhouetted so anyway they board the ship and get on and start looking for help from anyone on board but they quickly realize that seemingly this is a ghost ship in the sense of there's no one on board but the ship's still at sea yeah so they go into the corridors so the decor of the inside of the ship tallies up with it being an old ghost ship very like kind of again like titanic victorian-esque kind of old and, and rubbish and you know jess has gone in and she's getting this overwhelming feeling of deja vu and she says to the others i recognize this i've been here and they're all like shut the fuck up jess like do you know what i mean all of a sudden she's scrabbling around she finds a pair of keys she says these are my keys and again they're dismissing her well before that happens oh, though yeah. they hear the keys drop and what sounds like footsteps and when they follow it that's when they find the keys but jess realizes it's her own keys it's her car keys and she she's trying to work out like how could i have dropped them did someone take them and the explanation they come up with is that Heaven must have somehow got them or got hold of them and survived and already boarded the ship. So now in their minds, they're searching for Heather on the ship. Yeah, it, it, one of the characters even pulls up that explanation of being like ridiculous. Right, so Heather didn't drown, number one, and she's come to the ship, drop your keys. That makes no sense. But it's the most plausible scenario. It's, it's the most plausible. And to top that all off, Jess has a necklace of her son, like a pendant. On the keys is the other half of it. So she shows them so you're like you know you are getting really invested into this Declan you're like what is going on in this twilight zone <laughs> and the way it's been shot at times there's a lot of moments where characters are looking over their shoulders or looking back or looking down a certain corridor where other people are inspecting something 
you just get this eerie feeling the way the camera is positioned it's nearly as if it's the pov kind of looking at them like someone or something is watching i'm watching jess so they come across this piece of writing that's up on the wall somewhere and it's talking about this greek tragedy okay. it's the classic one we've all heard of where someone made a deal with death made a promise to them that they would return to the afterlife after being able to venture into the real living world again but they broke their promise and as punishment for eternity they had to roll a boulder up to a hill only for it to fall down again so they'd have to roll it back up again for the rest of time the winds of the father of sisyphus man condemned by the gods to the task of pushing a rock up a mountain only to see it roll back down again that's a pretty shitty punishment what do you do he cheated death or, no, he made a promise to death that he didn't keep. I studied it, but I can't remember. Can we just keep on moving, please? So we learn about that, and then you quickly forget about it because some other wacky shit's going on. They go into the room where there's this banquet laid out, but no one's there to eat it. Also, at the same time, Jess notices that her watch is the different time to everyone else but it is the same time as set on the ship and she's freaking out but i don't think she wants to mention it necessarily because she said a couple of things already of like i feel like i know this place and everyone's starting to get frustrated with her like shut up weird lady that we just met we're in this situation we don't need you being mental and having a breakdown on top of it so she's hesitant to say anything then at the same time she notices someone in the reflection of a mirror down a corridor she sees it just for a second and can't quite see who it is and she says it to everyone else and they're all freaking out so people split up and go and different directions jess is sort of still waiting around when she encounters victor again but victor somehow at this point has seemingly been attacked by someone he's covered in blood and she rushes over to help him but he immediately starts trying to choke her mm. and starts trying to kill her and you're like what the fuck is going on now and she manages to basically stick her fingers in a gaping hole yeah. in the back of his head and kill him because he's literally choking her to death so she is like what the fuck is happening then she hears gunfire going off. She runs into the theater. The married couple are already there and Greg has been shot. And she rushes over to see what's going on. But they're like, he says you shot him. Yeah. And she's like, what? What are you talking about? And they're like, you told us to come to the theater. And she's like, no, I didn't. When she says that, they're like, you are schizo. But before anything else can happen, some mysterious figure from above starts shooting them, kills the married couple. Jess runs away, not knowing what the fuck is going on. The same figure follows her, is tracking her down. They're having a fight, but she manages to eventually get the better of her and the figure as it's backing away from her is muffled and it's trying to say something to her and it nearly sounds like a girl's voice and by this time i'm already starting to think like who the fuck is this is this jess is this that? like what is going on and before she can't understand it before the figure throws himself overboard <laughs> So you're like, okay, like what the fuck is going on? All the characters are dead and this is like 20 minutes in. Yeah. So you're like, what the fuck is going on? And then you hear the sound of calls coming over and she looks over the edge of the ship and she can see the same boat capsized with all four of her friends, including herself, standing on top, just like they had entered the ship about half an hour before. And this is where... As we're aware, the first loop begins. Yeah. So or is it the first loop? So she was the mysterious figure they saw on the deck but couldn't quite make out. Exactly. So we're really into it now, Declan. But even recounting all of this, I'm starting to get a headache. It's That's a, the beauty of it. It moves so quick. It moves so fast. It's, it's This is definitely a film that you could watch a couple of times. You know, I had to kind of watch it once and re-skim over it again because even when I finished it, I was thinking about it. I was like, no. You know, when you see a film and you've seen it or you read a passage of a book you go a bit forwards and you're like hang on what actually mm. happened back i know then? all those words yeah what did that yeah mean yeah and i had to skim for it again because there's so much to take in it this film is a real brain bender mind fucker mm. so yeah it's a it's a great film like that jess is freaking the fuck out understandably she doesn't want to confront the new group that is entering the ship once again but she can hear the exact same conversation happening and she's just like what the fuck is going on and she accidentally comes across victor the second victor who yeah. is immediately like how did you get here so quick like he's he's confused because he obviously just left her back in the field back in the banquet room so she starts trying to explain it to him but obviously it sounds like nonsense and i really like this guy's acting you know when she first tries to explain like you guys are already dead this has already happened and he's just like what yeah. <laughs> downstairs right now is a copy of myself me walking and talking with greg oh, it's, what 
<laughs> no, it's really like well done how he does it. And this is the only bit of the film where I was really like, that was weak. You should have done that differently. Is the way she accidentally kills him. This is very stupid. Victor's played by Liam Hemsworth. That thing wasn't too good in this. I didn't think. Fair it, enough. Yeah, it was a bit wooden, but mm. but he does a job. You know, he's there to be like the young kind of eye candy guy. I guess um, this bit was you called it weak. This was just plain stupid. Mm. I believe they're not even arguing. They're just talking. And then for some reason, maybe out of just madness, she grabs him and pushes him. For some reason, there's a metal bit sticking out of... The... It's like a clothes peg. Yeah. It's just dumb. It could have been so easily, you know, she pushes him a bit and he slips and mm. bangs his head off yeah. a piece of metal sticking out or something. It, just, it was just weak. It goes into the back of his head and then, you know, I guess Declan, they done it to, 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 to show the loot. Then mm. we see where she grabs him by the neck in the theatre and he has the hole. He's like, where's the hole come from? Has he been shot? How's he mm. still moving? Obviously, the hole, the gaping hole that you refer to comes from being stuck by a protruding piece of metal. Well, obviously, by the fact that she already saw that happens means she can't actually be the first Jess that stepped on. We assume she is because we follow in her in the story but she's clearly not the first she's at least the second Jess but as we start to find out at least the third Jess if not many more Jesses to have come on board the ship and events are already set in motion and that events change every time a new Jess is introduced but they're also layered on top of what has already happened as the previous Jesses and groups gone on board and started to interact with each other either knowingly or not knowingly this is when we're really starting to get into the head trip of the film so Jess understandably freaks the fuck out because she accidentally killed someone she also during the conversation with Victor before accidentally wounding him no noticed a body in the water and it looked like it was the body of the husband of the married couple but can't quite see it because it's too far away by the time she points it out another interesting point that again reveals the fact this has already happened in some scenario is the fact that before victor's been wounded and he's bloody and he puts his hand on the rail the exact point where he puts his hand on the rail there's already a bloody hamper mm. and there's already a blood trail on the floor so you're thinking what is going on this has clearly already happened in some form but we're seeing it happen seemingly for the first time because this is a brand new Jess who's been influenced by previous cycles of people that have already been there so again you're like what the fuck is happening so she then encounters her previous self but in a new cycle mm. walking in and about to encounter Victor where Victor will strangle. being bloody try and strangle her yep. but she breaks the chain she changes the vent she goes out with the gun obviously freaks out the new Jess or the old Jess whichever way you yeah. want to look at it and Victor now sees this version of Victor sees oh shit it, there really is something crazy going on he doesn't die right this second he seemingly he's fucked up he can't really talk and she just says stay there i've already seen what's going to happen the married couple are going to be shot next so i need to go and try to save them so she runs to find them and when she finds them in the theater they're like you know you shot jet i love the way it's the same but slightly different like yeah. her, her first reaction is the same like you fucking bitch stay away but then she sees the gun this time they're getting shot they're hurt but she manages to get him out of the room and she actually does she clip the mysterious masked person and shooting from above at this point. Yeah, I think she does, yeah. We've also at this point seen our Jess drop her key that the new Jess will find, but also she found. So yeah, you start yeah, yeah. to see that she is affecting events in the future that will then happen to her in the past and also happen to the new versions of her that are boarding the ship. But the way she's reacting to these things that she's already done and the way she's interacting with the new Jess that are boarding the ship and going through the same timeline of events so therefore reacting the same way, but then she is reacting differently to her or interacting with her, which is causing history to slightly change and new possibilities arise, which will then affect the new Jesses and, and four friends that are boarding the ship. So it's an endless timeline of possibilities that will change what had already happened, but they've all so seemingly all happened at once because the reason you're getting these lingering shots when they first arrive from various angles is because her future self is already watching herself who's boarded the ship but it's not herself it's a new version of herself and we see the events are starting to form into a certain shape <laughs> Ooh, going round yeah there we because go so as much <laughs> as there seems to be countless jesses boarding the ship throughout history you get the feeling over time that there's only ever three jesses on the ship at any yeah. one time and as one dies another one boards so at most there's for a second for a small window of time there's two but there's almost always three yeah so she's rescued the married couple 
and takes him away. But while she's there, she's like, okay, stay here. I'm going to go with the gun. I'm going to find Victor. He's wounded, but he's in the bank room. Kind of dumb. It's like, just go with him. But yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll get let the film away at that point because yeah, exactly. they need to be separated for a moment. So while she leaves, she leaves them the gun and says, shoot anyone that isn't me that comes near it. And unfortunately, they do stick to that rule. But it is Jess that shows up, but it's a different version of her because we see it's the person in the overall with the, with hood, the, with the hood who's yeah. been killing everyone, removes their hood. And we see this must be some future version of Jess. So now we're seeing whatever new Jesses are coming on board. But we're also seeing older, more experienced Jesses who have been there longer and seemingly what Jess maybe inevitably is going to become like for whatever reason she's eventually going to become a homicidal maniac killing everyone that board ship. So she removes her things, goes out to the couple and basically says, yeah, yeah, come with me. And they're like, you can see she's got a wound in her head where the previous Jess shot her. Mm. Where our Jess that we're following throughout the story shot her. So she's bleeding from the head. She says, oh, come with me. And they go to this room that we've seen earlier. Greg and our Jess that we're following throughout the story during the first cycle walked into a room, 237, The Shining. Nice little Oh, wow, 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 yeah. They walk into the room and they find smeared in blood on the mirror go to the theatre. So they're like, what the fuck is that about? This same room, this future Jess, who's killing everyone with the hood on, brings the married couple in there and then starts killing them she managed to kill the husband but sally the wife manages to escape she's freaking out she's running around underboard she's running away from obviously the deadly jess but she's also at times seeing our jess yeah who is obviously trying to save she's her but doesn't realize this has happened so she's freaking out she doesn't even know there's two jesses so she's hiding from both sally ends up making the sos call we hear at the beginning of the story saying she's killing everyone yeah. or whatever can you hear me help me Please help me. She's killing everyone. They're dead. They're all dead. Our Jess sees Sally and she follows her around the corner because she's trying to protect him. Obviously, you know, Sally's starting to lose blood and she's getting weaker. You can't really get away. And we turn the corner and it's beautifully directed because there's this moment of silence and we just hear the seagull cawing in the background. And it's such a great reveal. <laughs> Sally's ended up in a spot where I guess she always ends up every time the scenario is played out where she makes her way but eventually is weak and runs into a dead end and she lays down on the floor dying surrounded by what looks like 30, Other 40 Sally's, yeah. copies of her own dead body. And it is it's one of my all-time reveals in a movie. Yeah, so Sally, poor Sally, she's essentially trapped. She's always going to end there. No, no getting out for her. So quite sad, really. But she was a bitch, so <laughs> I like that. So it's a really sad moment because Sally's terrified of her because she thinks she's killing everyone. She's trying to be like, no, we're going to get off the ship. Like, we can do it. Like, blah, blah, blah. But she gets distracted by a fight down below on the lower deck. She looks out and she sees the scenario she was in earlier where she was fighting the mysterious hooded figure and this time it's a bit different rather than the hooded figure jumping over the edge by choice that Jess seems to kill this figure and I don't know if it's the fact that she's changed events by revealing herself Jess which didn't happen before but seemingly that's changed events in history and now she's more aggressive or whatever I don't know but anyway she kills that Jess that we now know is Jess and throws her over the side at the same time Sally starts to die and she finally passes and at that exact second a new boat starts to arrive and that's when our Jess puts together that the loop restarts once everyone who arrived in that shipment dies yeah or at least a version of them yeah so she's crazy man yeah so you're like crazy the fuck? yeah so that's when jess basically decides like okay i think i know what i need to do i'm gonna get everyone on board and as they arrive when they get on board i'm gonna jump off and jump try and get to the boat or just try and escape so everyone comes on board she starts trying to fulfill the version of jess she's already seen so she goes hides all the bodies and throws them overboard gets the gun gets Gets the overall, gets the hood over her head. She goes, kills Greg, shoots him, kills everyone else down below, kills Victor. And then she gets into the scenario that she was in at the beginning with the original Jess that's trying to kill her or, or gets the better of her. And once again, she's unable to change events so that she wins this time mm. and just as she's about to get attacked by the first Jess who was technically our Jess but isn't our Jess anymore she's saying to her the message that first Jess was being told where she's saying you have to kill it it's for your son, for our son you have to do it and you're thinking for our son what does that mean but before you know any better she jumps overboard and she wakes up on the beach on the beach yeah and it's the same setting 
as we saw a glimpse of in her dream when she first got on the boat and fell asleep. So you're like, oh, what's going on? But maybe it was just, you know, seeding it for the audience before it happens. You know, you kind of, you're trying to work out what's going on so much that you just get roll with it. So anyway, she's on the beach and she's back and she's like, you know, she's fucking pulling seaweed out of her hair and like trying to get like, she looks like she's just woken up after the worst bender ever. But she's like, fuck it, like I'm back. And she walks, she managed to eventually get back to the town or the city or hitchhike or however she gets back, gets back to her house and she realizes, oh, wait, this was the morning before this is the morning i was leaving i've still gone back in time she goes to the window and her son spots the clone of her mm. outside freaks out that's what makes him drop the paint that you see makes her freak out at the start of the story and you get to see what jess is actually like in her home life and you realize she has not been coping with raising her autistic son alone she is lashing out and she's become abusive to him you know she's literally having an out-of-body experience where she's getting to see how she actually acts with her son from the third person. And she's so disturbed by it. Do you see she puts a plan together where she's going to ring the doorbell to distract her? Why does she distract her? It's so that she never actually kills her son, which really happened at start of the story. Yeah. The start of before any of the loops happened was her freaking out and finally lashing out and murdering her own son. To stop that happening, she rings the doorbell to distract her, goes back around. We see it's a great moment where she comes in with a hammer and bludgeons her to death. We see that moment where she embraces her son and tells her, him not to worry. Where, like I said, like it seems like she's more reassuring herself. And realise that was actually happening at the end. Or is it then? Because the whole film seems to be a loop. Mom is fine, you see. Mom is fine. Oh, you just had a bad dream, that's all, baby. That's all it was. Like we saw at the beginning where she's putting this dress in a bag, we realise it's the dress that was covered in blue paint that her original self was wearing. She stuffs it into the bag, her own dead body, puts it into the boot and is driving away with her son. Everything's great. Everything's fine. She made it. She's got back to reality. Her son is alive. She's with him. She's going to live. She's never going to enter the loop. It's all beautiful. And then a seagull hits the bonnet of the car, covers it in blood. She pulls over, grabs the seagull and goes to throw it off onto the beach. And as she throws it off, we see that there's literally maybe 30, 40, 50 seagull bodies, complete clones of each other already there. And you realize she's still in a loop, maybe a loop of the loop. And she's been here time and time again. And she gets back in her car, freaked out, tries to drive off, ends up crashing her car. Flipping it. Yeah. Again, killing her son. <laughs> goes into this saturated view as we see this scene of her son died her body that was locked in the thing has come out of the boot and been laid across the road and seemingly just looked oh, her geez, driving the yeah, car yeah. somehow she came out there you see her looking on at it and a taxi driver pulls up who has a very ominous tone doesn't feel like a real taxi yeah. driver and he offers her a ride and she goes to back to the That's... harbor because obviously she puts it together that the only way she can save her son's life is by going back through the loop so she can come back ground again so she's going to put her through all that agony and as we see her approaching the dock and she goes up like she did at the beginning of the film hugs greg and says sorry and he's like why are you sorry for now we know it's because she's chosen to doom all four of those people including greg killing them putting them into this endless loop nightmare so that she can go back and save her son and it all starts to make sense now the ominous god taxi driver whoever he is says i'll leave the meter running gets onto the pier and then we understand the conversations we've had earlier victor goes victor goes where's your son you meant to bring in your son she says he's in school and he goes are you sure about that so we all kind of put mm. it together in our head and you know greg comes up to her and hugs her and says are you all right like we don't have to go sailing if you don't want to you can come another day and she says no i need to and then the camera kind of pans up to this fucking bastard seagull sitting on the cell like kind of looking around mm. and you know what we realize is the loop will continue mm. again and again i don't know if 
she can get out. Of this no, thing. I don't think she can because the right. seagull that happens to just land on their boat obviously also gets carried through the loop. Yeah. And also then escapes the loop with her only to fly around and get hit by a car. car. So the seagull that we see at the beginning is also already dead in the present time but in its own future because it's gone back through the loop. And it's always going to land there and then always going to travel through the loop, come back hit into the car. loop, hit the thing and cause them to crash. What about the taxi driver as well? The taxi driver specifically ask her are you definitely going to come back she promises them yes just like in the greek tragedy where the person promised death they were going to come back to the afterlife but they broke their promise and as a result they would have to for eternity push their boulder up to the top of the hill only for it to roll down again and jess seemingly i guess as punishment for losing her shit and killing her son is for eternity going to be in this endless loop and struggle to go through all these horrific events and then choose to return back through those horrific events in an attempt to save her son. But part of the reason why the loop will always be infinite is because when we see Jess at the start of the film, that is a Jess that has already been through the loop and is choosing to go back through the loop. When she falls asleep on the boat, her memory is wiped. Like the girl mm-hmm. says to her, dreams wipe away the trauma from your daily life. She forgets up until that point she remembers everything that happens in the film but she forgets it at that moment and from then onwards everything really is confusing to her she really is remembering the boat because she actually has been there before i recognize this corridor why not so pretty soon no that's not it so you got to think how many levels of the loop are there because there's a loop of once she enters the boat there's at least three jesses there on the boat seemingly more then there's the fact that there's then a jess that eventually leaves the boat goes back around gets in a car crash with her son and chooses to go back onto the boat which creates a new loop a new cycle of three jesses through but also changes the jesses that are aboard that ship because now mm. she's messing with the event mm. and then she'll eventually get off go back around and accidentally kill her son again choose to go back to the harbour lose her memory again and get back on the boat and we see the fact that we go through about i guess three jesses on the boat but there's what 50 bodies of sally when she loses her necklace pendant there's 50 necklaces down that drain when she throws the seagull over there's how many countesses of seagulls and the thing is if you think work it out we see what there's there's so many jesses that go through every cycle of being on the boat say let's say it's six but i think it might be actually much more than that but let's say it's six jesses that go through the cycle of being on the boat to end up getting back to crashing with her son because for every six jesses that gets on the boat and three cycles of going back around on the boat is how many i think you need in order to get to the point where she crashes with her son so she crashes with her son chooses to get back on so there's that would be one seagull for every six jesses that gets on the boat so when we see on the beach there's like what 50 seagulls or how many ever so many seagull dead bodies so that means what 50 times six jesses getting on the boat you're getting into hundreds of jesses so i guess it's a hell punishment that she's on forever as punishment for the not only the fact that she killed her son but she won't accept what she'd done she's gonna always try to go back and get back to her son and find a timeline where her son either doesn't die in the crash or isn't killed by herself but it becomes an infinite loop for various reasons but partly down to the fact that she loses her memory every time she falls asleep on the boat again so she's destined to repeat endlessly and suffer forever until I guess she accepts that her son is dead and goes and respects the fact that she can't change what she did and she killed her son to the cab driver Mm. goes back to death exactly yeah oh fucking hell i mean before this started i did say like you know it's very i'm gonna tell the truth it's very very hard to follow i'm i probably got a lot wrong there as well i'm grateful for that explanation It, it very much reminds me of a game that i've talked about before called returnal where it won game of the year it was a fantastic game on PlayStation 5 you're an astronaut and you crash your ship on an alien planet and you're going through every time you die it resets you crashing and the whole map resets and you have to go about the whole stuff again and again and it just you know it was so hard to complete because when you die you lose all the great weapons you've picked up so it's very much a once you die it's over Mm, you reset yeah and once you you can only save it at certain points and once you complete it it was so hard it took me weeks upon weeks upon months to complete it every time Declan and I got 
towards the end, mm. I'm not. Like, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. You're a Groundhog Day, and yeah, yeah. eventually you know how and to then, play it off. And then literally, I can't explain to you when I beat that final boss. There's like five or six huge bosses, and once you beat them, it saves. So like, if you if you lose to like the third boss, you're like, oh, I've reset all over again. I can't explain to you the feeling of satisfaction I got when I completed the mm. game after months. And it was like and that. Just will never know that. Yeah, it's like once I this film like I'm not gonna lie I found it a hard watch just to how fast it was and you know keeping up with the plot your explanation I I wasn't grasping it and I'm not thick it was just difficult to get that premise mm. that you've just outlined. I think once you kind of know what it's at least yeah. getting at and rewatch it again and again. I've rewatched it just this week three times because it is just such a layered, detailed, fantastic film trying to get your head around all the possibilities. Yeah, I mean, the best way to describe it is Groundhog Day mixed with Twilight Zone. Legit. Like. It's Groundhog Day if every single groundhog was interacting with each other simultaneously. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't want to put any viewers of this episode off from watching it it's a very good film um it's very well made for its budget you i think you're very right to call out the special effects that did that that was a bit of a weak point um the death pushing into the protruded metal was just a bit what fuck like 100 percent should have been done better like that was just mm. idiotic in it in avoidable own. weak moment avoidable yeah. weak moment but this film's very rewarding in the fact that like, I might actually rewatch it again this weekend. Now, from your explanation, fully understanding it, I didn't. I I'm gonna be honest with you. I didn't disconnect. I uh, sorry. I didn't connect the taxi driver with being deaf. That's kind of changed my whole perception of it. So I need to go and rewatch it. Um, you know, I think as you said, it's good that it's only an hour and a half as well. Because any longer, I would have given up. Mm. It like it's it's such a mind bender, but if you understand what it's trying to get at it's a it's a one of those films like an onion with so many layers so for me it's definitely worth a watch absolutely yeah. i recommend this film like you said for an hour and a half film it managed to pack in so much stories and so much layers that you can only really infer from what has happened whatever suggestion is made as you follow through the logic of what that must mean it just opens up more and more layers and more and more possibilities and the film is just never ending in your own mind Although it is kind of ending because it has a continuous loop that seems to go mm. on forever. But that in itself is just so amazing. Like I love head fuck movies and this film grabs you by the ears and fucking fucks your head in. Like it is just incredible. And as much as we've seen so many of these time loop movies or Groundhog Day movies or head fuck movies before, there's elements that feel familiar, but there's something quite distinct and unique about the premise and concept of this particular film. And for such a small budget, it really is brilliant hand at the directing and the performances. I really like the performances, especially the lead actress. It just comes together and makes a really unique, distinct film. Not quite a horror film, not quite a head fuck film, not quite a time travel film, not quite a time loop film. And it just hits every note right. So absolutely recommend Triangle. Triangle.